So here we are down in Kevin's farm and the RV's sitting there ready to go. We're just uh, getting the last minute preparations here for our fifth trip together and uh, got the, the slide still out of course and the Jeep has to be some minor final configurations there. We have to put a few more things in the RV and then we're heading out maybe 7 uh, or sorry 8.30 or so. We'll see what happens. been pretty good. See, dash air conditioner system seems that sometimes the fan motor isn't as reliable as I'd like it to be, so we might have to have that looked at. But so far, knock on wood, uh, it's rolling down the road pretty fair. And uh, so far, the Jeep is following us very nicely, which is always good. <clears throat> We're about 222 kilometers from the uh, American border right now. Uh, we will cross in Detroit and then we're heading south about uh, another <clears throat> 60 or 70 kilometers to <clears throat> a town called Monroe and Sterling Point State Park would be the campsite for the next couple of nights if everything works out. So that's where we are here in uh, the uh, Ontario landscape and we've got a bit of drive cam going here and there. So we'll talk to you later. So we're here at the West Lorn <clears throat> um, en route. And we just pulled in here for a minute to have some eat lunch, go to the bathroom. And uh, we're about 140 kilometers from the border. And uh, just a uh, nice place to stop the RV. We probably won't stop for gas until we get to the States. We probably don't need it. Because we're just going, if nothing changed, we're just going just south of Detroit, so should be okay. Anyhow, that's your update for now. So this is uh, Sterling State Park in Monroe, Michigan. This is just half of the campground. And we're kind of, where'd my finger go? Here, here we go. So we're around that corner in about there. Myself and Diane. And it's nice here. It's quiet. Lots of people having a nice time on the pretty hot, uh, probably 36 or 37 today. A lot of people in Lake Erie swimming away. And uh, we've... Uh, the RV here and we're just bringing the temperature down with the uh, air conditioning so it's getting a bit better it's been pretty hot though for a little while there but we got some food and got some dinner and I'm feeling a lot better than I was a while ago so we'll, we'll uh, pick this up at other places along the way two or three hundred people here Gary out behind that pickup truck and you can see the extent of that's the north campground and we just come right around here that's where I came from and here's the south campground so it's quite a extensive place and uh, like I said everybody seems to be doing very well here down by the lake and see what's going on there. It's a nice beach. And back around the beach.
So there's our sea breeze and all things considered, did very well today. We got down here from Orangeville in probably six and a half hours, 450k, including uh, probably half an hour at the border. Uh, the guard seemed most interested in if we were carrying any people and asked us about what we were carrying from the sample of materials. Here's a beautiful um, lagoon beside the campsite and then some trees and then we come around to the rest of the campers in our little side here so we have at least wilderness on one side of our site but that restricts all we have is hydro we don't have full service here but there are only five empty sites when I started reserving this so I think we did pretty well I had to park the RV backwards because the slope is significant here and to get it level to jack the front up I had to turn it around but no one seems to mind and that seems to work really well and uh, around we go it's supposed to get a bit of rain tomorrow maybe and uh, we'll see but we'll leave you with this wonderful view here at Stony Point State Park Monroe Michigan in Ohio, where you can see the sister, Catherine, discussing flight with the brothers that's on the white sheet on your map. The first show there is at 11 o'clock. Sir Bennett Sweet Shop, H.J. Heinkoff.
Okay, so it's Greenfield Village where we wanted to go last year, we didn't get there and we're just getting started. We just rode the train which is just chugging away now. We rode it about a halfway around the park and this is going to be a fantastic day. I can just see there's so many interesting things here. For those of you who don't understand, uh, Greenfield Village was a... <clears throat> Henry Ford used to collect historical things as he made his way in the early part of the 20th century. And this collection <clears throat> began to grow and he ultimately was turned into a magnificent museum. And this village, which was meant to be celebrating American history and innovation. So what they've done is move famous things, famous buildings that they can to this one site. Uh, you'll find here, for example, uh, the Edison um, Laboratory, um, <clears throat> Henry Ford's birthplace, homes of the Wright brothers and so on, and so many other things here, and that's the whole logic of it, and it's kept in fantastic condition. So anyhow, we're going to enjoy the day, and we'll see you later. So I got off the train near the covered bridge. Bridges were covered to protect the road deck from rotting, which would prevent, uh, make the bridge have to be repaired more frequently, and there were quite a few of them around America and Canada. If you move on to the Edison homestead, and there's a lot of Edison at this particular park because Edison was uh, a friend of Henry Ford's. Henry Ford had profound respect for the great inventor, and uh, <clears throat> so a great amount of Edison's resources are preserved here, far more so than probably would otherwise have been had it been left up to others. Thomas Edison, of course, is famous for having 1,093 patents to his name, <clears throat> and he was a very, very competent inventor, no question about it. He was a bit of a showman. He was also a pretty good uh, businessman, taking many of his inventions and putting them to market and making good money doing so. But there are others out there who arguably were uh, every bit his equal. Uh, one of which would be George Westinghouse, who invented the air brake for the railroad cars and numerous other things along the way, and uh, ultimately won the war of the currents back in the late 1890s. George Westinghouse was a nice guy. <clears throat> he let his own workers keep their own patents when they invented things. If you add up the patents that were earned under his tutelage, it's in, it is in excess of Edison, who kept all the patents that were invented even by people who worked for him. Westinghouse uh, had insurance for his employees and other types of adventurous things that most uh, corporate type people did not do in those days. But uh, Westinghouse um, didn't have the same quite hardcore business acumen and was regrettably lost control of his companies in the early part of World War I. And uh, there isn't really a credible museum to him uh, that I'm aware of right now, which is a real shame because he is truly a lion. As you walk around Greenfield Village, there's all kinds of old-fashioned cars operating. They, uh, they run very nicely. You can, for a few dollars, you can get a chance. <clears throat> One of the things that drew me to the Greenfield Village was the fact that the Edison facilities had been reconstructed. Uh, the primary, well, arguably the first legitimate research laboratory was Menlo Park at, in New Jersey that Edison had built under his, well, had his father help construct the buildings. And here was where the light bulb was invented and the phonograph and a host of other things. Now this uh, building you see in front of you right now, the brick building, is the powerhouse where they uh, produce the ele electricity necessary. And here is the primary research lab. This, of course, is largely a recreation. The original one was left to rot when they moved to West Orange. And it was um, basically the top floor had collapsed in and they had a lot of work to do to bring it back to what you have here. But nevertheless, it was done. Uh, Edison died in 30, 1931, so wouldn't have had too much to do with all of this, no doubt. You were only generally given access to the first floor, and things are representative more than, uh, let's say, how they would have been. Uh, here's some batteries, for example. Edison was famous for all the different types of batteries, uh, different materials they used for battery technology at the time. Uh, here is one of the steam engines that was used, of course, to produce... Uh, motive power in this case uh, the pulleys along the ceiling would spin the mechanical devices in the machine shop here to 
to allow for uh, them to fabricate different devices and so on. Of course, Edison is certainly one of the most credible mechanical geniuses in history. Every bit as good, in my view, as Da Vinci or perhaps better. Um, here's the telephone assembly room, the telephones before they were sent out. And notice the microphones. Uh, the phone that was invented by Bell was not effective uh, commercially without the carbon microphone that Edison had invented. You can also take a carriage ride around Greenfield Village. Here's a chunk of his west orange uh, fronting that's also here, built in 1885. Edison made a lot of money by then because of the light bulb. And then, of course, we have a representative train station, which is essential for any type of, uh, of old Americana. Here's the old-fashioned uh, roundhouse with the uh, turntable that would rotate around. This is the ash dump for the locomotives, where they dump out uh, the remnants of their burnings for the day. And of course the water tower and the coal tipple, uh, which would be uh, on every town's landscape for the first 130 years. This is old rail. You can see that the top is flat topped and it's square. Uh, this is probably a hundred year old rail, just guessing from what I've seen before. Uh, this is a constructor uh, that would be on the rail. It's just a steam engine in there. This would be pushed along the rail and they could use this for crane work as appropriate. I'm not sure if it's functional or not, but uh, you can see that everything is done by pulleys and so forth based on the engine's winching capability. And a representative small depot. Uh, this would have been the, the hive of most towns in those days where the telegraph key came in, where the news came in, where the time was kept. Uh, and one can imagine how much fun that must have been. The Wright family also was well represented here. Um, the not only was the bicycle shop brought over but also the home on 8 Hawthorne Street was disassembled piece by piece and brought over to the place. One of the things I, I learned while I was here which was amazing was that um, Orville Wright himself uh, actually supervised the reconstruction of his home and the bicycle shop which is pretty amazing and this is the Wright cycle shop that was downtown Dayton Ohio back at the turn of the century. The back here, the machine shop, Orville actually had Charlie Taylor come in who had been his machinist and he was the one who supervised so that this really does look the way it did look in those days and we had the actual people who did it there which was just super cool to see this. You come in the back door here, this is all Orville Wright's desk uh, in the bike shop. Uh, I guess you could argue the still the brothers of that time as they marketed there were different types of bicycles. They originally had done parts and they started inventing their own bicycles as well. Uh, at the time this was a, a big deal. Uh, the bicycle craze was in full bloom. There's one of the four cylinder engines they're making here in the back. The first engine they made was a four a single cylinder engine that um, Wilbur had designed and Charlie Taylor, a very competent engineer, helped build many of the other ones. And of course, there's, as you would expect, there's a history of the Ford Motor Company here as well. So this is one of their original assembly buildings. This was built at one quarter scale to the original structure. And in here, which is quite interesting, is the 15 millionth Model T Ford. And they have an engine display as well and uh, all the rest. I didn't ride in one of the old vehicles, but I was tempted here as a bus. Uh, it's always kind of a, a culture shock because you see modern clothing and the old vehicles. This is also a nice tour through an old machine shop. Uh, you can see the belts all going to the ceiling where the um, motive power was. This is one of the large steam engines and the flywheel sending power up to the ceiling spindles. Uh, this was a type of technique that was discontinued after the war when now each machine would have its own electric motor. But you can see the shop itself and I believe in part it's still functional. At the end of town, there's a working farm, which was quite interesting as well. And there was animals and gardens and so forth. Uh, I also had a chance to see very what's quite rare now is a working semaphore sign. So not only do you have the uh, paddle pointing to the rotation of the switch, but as it moves, it changes the color of the switch. Here's also an archaic uh, crossing sign. There is a uh, red light that swings in and out. And here's the locomotive on its way. So there's the semaphore sign in the horizontal position right now, um, showing red, I suspect. 
We move into the Henry Ford Museum. This is the presidential limousine of John F. Kennedy. This was the car in which he lost his life in Dallas, Texas. One of the things that was really remarkable when I spoke to people that day was that uh, this car was reconstructed by the Secret Service and hardened uh, so that it could be used by other presidents. And many people thought this was actually very insensitive that such a horrific event that the car should either be put in a museum or you know, simply discontinued somehow. But that was not the sensitivities of 1964. And the car was used right up to the time of President Reagan, I think, or certainly Carter, uh, certainly a number of years after the accident. As you move on through the Henry Ford Museum, there's steam locomotives. This is a uh, tender's auger, which feeds at the bottom of the tender is feeds coal into the engine. We see the initial trucks that were starting to show up in the late 1940s, early 1950s, as the highways began to get better and we could move things around more effectively. This is also uh, uh, the Ford tri-motor airplane that was used by Admiral Byrd when he did his Antarctic uh, type of experiences. And uh, so these are very historic because uh, the Ford Motor Company did not, after a few years, did not involve itself. One of the things I never expected to see here is the actual bus in which Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat back in 1953 and arguably began the Civil Rights Movement. The bus was found in a valley, it was completely rusted out and all the rest of it, but they checked and made sure it was the exact value and it's been brought back to, to life in a remarkable way. So this was something I didn't expect uh, here and uh, it was truly amazing to to come upon this true piece of history. This is an example of uh, the assembly line of how the Model T Ford comes together and all the distant representative pieces that flow together to it. They were building a car every minute or four minutes or something like that and part of the problems that led uh, to the challenges in the depression were simply overproduction. There's a great number of electrical generator type, uh, steam type generating systems here. There is a triple expansion steam engine. The right one is the high pressure cylinder and as you move over the pressure drops and therefore the cylinders to get wider to produce the same amount of force to balance the pistons. And so there's a great number of these uh, all over the back area of the Henry Ford Museum. It's absolutely fantastic and you can read the plaques to get the details of where these particular engines served and how they they did their job. It's just amazing. And as we end a beautiful day, uh, there's the 7-4 signal. And thanks for watching.